His widow, Nadezhda Krupskaya, watched his disciples carry his coffin from the sanatorium where he had spent his last days. A special train was to bear it to Moscow past crowds stricken with grief. Less than seven years earlier, he had led the Bolsheviks to victory in the world's first Marxist revolution. He had replaced Tsarist autocracy with the dictatorship of the Communist Party and come to fill in the minds of his people the place left vacant by the Tsars. Now he was gone, leaving behind no obvious heir. Five men who had run the country during the last months of his illness were disunited on what to do with Russia next. And Lenin had made the problem worse by laying down no clear line on the issue of the succession in the notes he had dictated before his death about his close disciples. Comrade Trotsky is without doubt the most able man in the party central committee, but he is also distinguished by his too far-reaching self-confidence. Lenin had said about the leading radical of the party. Lenin's right-hand man in the 1917 revolution and his commissar of war since. Trotsky was feared by the rest of the leadership as Lenin's natural successor. Comrade Bukharin is the favorite of the whole party and its greatest and most able theoretician. But his views can only with very great doubt be regarded as truly Marxist, Lenin had said about the youngest member of the communist ruling group. He was the editor of Pravda, the party paper, and the chief hope of the moderates. Between these two extremes of the political spectrum stood three men, chiefly united by their determination to stop Trotsky. Lev Kaminev, Lenin's brother-in-law and the man in effective charge of the government during the last few years of Lenin's life. Grigory Zinoviev, an equally long-term associate of Lenin and president of the Communist International. Joseph Stalin. He was the least well-known of the five rivals, but powerful as the boss of the party machine. Lenin had said little about Kaminev and Zinoviev in the notes that came to be seen as his will. But he had harsh words for Stalin, made general secretary of the party on Lenin's own recommendation in 1922. Stalin is too rude, and this fault, though permissible in us communists, becomes unbearable in the office of the General Secretary. I propose that the comrades find a way to remove Stalin from the position and appoint to it another man, someone more patient, more loyal, more polite, more attentive, less capricious. But far from being ousted from his job, Stalin was to rise in the next five years to rule the country more dictatorially than Lenin had ever done. Stalin's first task was to survive in his post as boss of the party machine in spite of Lenin's will. At a special meeting of the party central committee in May 1924, Stalin and his allies put into action their plan to prevent Lenin's will being carried out. It was a dramatic occasion, as Boris Bajanov, Stalin's personal assistant at the time, remembers. After Kamenev had read the will, there was painful silence. Then Zinoviev took the floor and began to speak. He said, 
Comrades, you know that we have sworn to carry out Lenin's will in every respect, and we will carry it out. Every word of his is law to us. But we are happy to be able to say that his fears regarding our General Secretary have turned out to be unfounded, and that our General Secretary has worked together with the Central Committee splendidly over the last few months and without any friction. Everyone knew that this was not true. The struggle against Trotsky and for the succession was raging, and people lowered their eyes. Trotsky considered the whole thing a comedy beneath his contempt, and the expression on his face showed his disgust, but he said nothing. Stalin sat at the edge of the rostrum and was staring out of the window. His expression was strange. His fate hung in the balance. Would he remain in power or not? He remained silent, looking out of the window. The question was put to the vote immediately. The Central Committee voted that Stalin should remain General Secretary. There was no debate. And that's how Zinoviev saved Stalin. But the real struggle for power went on under the guise of a fierce debate on how to realize Lenin's dream, the building of a socialist Russia. Trotsky, a brilliant orator, was campaigning for a rapid push towards socialism. Bukharin, the economic brain of the party, was for gradual progress. Stalin, without ideas of his own to contribute, exploited the differences among his rivals with ruthless opportunism. First he outmaneuvered the radicals by relying on the moderates. Then he not only used the radicals' ideas to get rid of the moderates, but also went on to put these ideas into practice in a more extreme form than the radicals had ever envisaged. The country whose faith the Bolsheviks were debating seemed an unlikely candidate for becoming the land of socialism. Marx had envisaged socialism as the final stage of industrial civilization. Russia at the time of Lenin's death was a vast peasant empire, a whole epoch behind the West in development. Peasants made up four-fifths of the population. During the Civil War, they had given their support to the Bolsheviks, who had done away with the landlords. But they were interested only in holding on to their share of the landlords' estates, not in seeing Russia become a socialist country. And though they lived better than before, they produced little more food on their small plots of land than what they and their families ate. Russia's industry had begun to grow rapidly at the turn of the century, but it was then ruined by six years of war, revolution and civil strife, which also thinned out the ranks of the industrial proletariat. The Bolsheviks had started to reconstruct Russian industry, but output was still far below levels reached before the First World War. In the face of this situation, Trotsky called for radical methods. He demanded rapid industrialization, financed out of heavy taxes on the peasantry. And he pressed for continued pursuit of the old Bolshevik dream of world revolution to unite the industrial countries of the West and backward Russia in a socialist commonwealth. But the country wanted peace and an easier life, not more campaigns after years of war, revolution and social upheaval. Our century will continue in a moment on A&E. The Red Czar.
Russia had taken eagerly to the policies introduced by Lenin in the early 20s to revitalize the economy after the Civil War. These meant a retreat from Marxist-type state control, but led to an economic boom. In industry, private and nationalized firms competed with each other. Shops were nearly all in private hands. Peasants could sell their produce in town markets freely and for a good price. All this gave neither the masses nor even the party membership much appetite for the radical ideas of Trotsky. It was this new mood of the party membership that Stalin and his allies moved to exploit when they turned Lenin into a cult figure and accused Trotsky of trying to steer the Soviet Union off the road marked out for it by its founder. Trotsky's demand for industrializing the country at the expense of the peasants would, they said, wreck the so-called peasant-worker alliance, the basis of Lenin's more relaxed economic policies. And in place of Trotsky's idea of world revolution, they launched the slogan of socialism in one country. Russia was alone, they explained. No help from the Western proletariat would be forthcoming. Instead of trying to set fire to the rest of the world, the country should settle down to building socialism by itself. This was a daring as well as a reassuring concept. It held out before Russia's masses the prospect of peace instead of revolutionary campaigns and the vision of their backward country rising to lead mankind towards its socialist future. It combined the Marxist idea with an old mystical view Russians held of their country as destined to redeem the world. Trotsky's past especially his disagreements with Lenin before the revolution, were at the same time being raked up by his enemies. In all this, Stalin let his allies do the shouting while he got on with securing his grip on the party. Stalin used his hold on the party machine to force Trotsky to resign as Commissar of War in January 1925. As soon as Trotsky was out of the race for the succession, Stalin turned against his former allies, Kamenev and Zinoviev. They responded by taking up Trotsky's radical ideas, demanding rapid industrialization and the grouping of Russia's millions of peasants in collective farms. Stalin used this to denounce them as fanatical industrializers out of touch with the needs of Russia and enemies of the Russian peasant. In 1926, he forced Kamenev and Zinoviev out of the Politburo, the party's inner cabinet. In getting rid of the radicals, Stalin had relied on Bukharin, the leading moderate in the party and his only remaining rival. For the next three years, they ruled Russia together, Bukharin making policy and Stalin supplying the organizational muscle. Karin believed in encouraging the peasants to produce more food for the towns by paying them higher prices. He was telling them to grow prosperous and wanted to see them modernize their farms. And he wanted to see Russia evolve gradually into a socialist country rather than forcing the pace. So he gave free enterprise scope and let the country enjoy the relaxation of controls originally introduced by Lenin. Policies pursued by Stalin and Bukharin ran into trouble in 1927 when Russia found itself facing an economic crisis.
was growing unemployment in the towns, and shortages of both industrial goods and food combined with inflation to produce misery. The crisis had a profound effect on the party. The views of the membership shifted towards the radicals' demands. They now wanted a comprehensive program of industrializing Russia to wipe out unemployment and of raising agricultural output to feed the towns. At the same time, Russia's isolation from the West was generating fears of a major war with the capitalist world. This was the mood that gave rise to the idea of a five-year plan. It was to harness all of the country's resources to a vast effort of turning Russia into an industrialized fortress of socialism. The idea of a five-year plan caught the party's imagination, but its details went on being furiously debated and radically altered even after the plan had begun to be put into practice in 1928. The party's left demanded a faster and faster pace as a response to the crisis facing Russia, and regardless of whether this made economic sense. There are no fortresses the Bolsheviks cannot conquer, was their slogan. Bukharin rejected the ideas of the left as economic romanticism, likely to lead to disaster. But the industrializing fever had got hold of the party and it gave Stalin his chance to move against his last remaining rival. Having ousted Trotsky, Zinoviev and Kaminev as reckless radicals, Stalin now put himself at the head of the party's left and accused Bukharin of sabotaging the transformation Russia needed. Backed by the fervent support of the radicals, in 1929, Stalin turned Bukharin out of the Politburo. So, at the age of 50, Yosef Vissarionovich Stalin, the shoemaker's son from Georgia, and the man Lenin had least wanted to have succeed him, was in complete control of Russia. His birthday in December 1929 was turned into a feast of adulation for the man party officials now began to call Khazyain, the master. A long debate was over, and the time had come for action in obedience to a single will. In the next five years, Stalin drove Russia into a second revolution, more sweeping and far more violent than had been the upheaval of 1917. He seemed intoxicated with the idea of turning Russia from a peasant empire into an industrial power, ready under his leadership to challenge the capitalist world. So he took the radicals' ideas and pushed them to their logical extremes, which lay beyond the borders of sanity. And instead of recoiling from the bedlam that ensued, he seemed to revel in orchestrating it as a task fit for a giant. Our century will continue in a moment on A&E. His first priority was agriculture. Russia needed to produce more food, and it also needed capital for its industrialization drive. Both could only come from the peasants, and the Bolshevik plan was to make them produce more at lower costs. But to try and increase efficiency while drawing off the peasants' earnings, the party had to bring them under its firm control. So the Bolsheviks decided to replace Russia's patchwork of millions of small peasant holdings with collective farms. Nor was 
Is this just an economic move? The Bolsheviks saw Russia's deeply religious peasantry as the bulwark of attitudes they meant to abolish. The peasants, four-fifths of the population, went on living their lives as they always had. So the Bolsheviks regarded collectivization as carrying their revolution to the countryside to replace the traditional attitudes with a new socialist outlook. What Stalin did was to speed up the plans, mixing persuasion with brute force. Leuka Rish was a young farmer in the Ukraine at the time. Every evening, a party member came from town to our village. He would call a meeting and try to talk us into joining the collective farm, painting a picture of the wonderful life we poor people would have there. But most people didn't believe him, and only a few of the more naive among us joined the collective. Then the district authorities called out a whole squad of activists from town. They wrenched the locks off our stable doors, took away our horses, and led them to the farmyard of the collective. And they said to us, these horses are not yours now. If you take them back, you will be dealt with like thieves. People were stunned. There was nowhere to turn for help. No way of deliverance from this evil. Some, in despair, committed suicide. The Bolsheviks saw themselves bringing the peasants a new way of life. To the peasants, they were intruders who had come to destroy all that was most sacred. When peasant resistance showed itself, the Bolsheviks regarded it as an attack on the party's rule. They answered it with violence by the squads of enthusiastic activists and detachments of the police. So collectivization turned into a war between the peasantry and the party. Whole villages were razed with artillery fire or burned to the ground. Better-off peasants, the so-called kulaks, were herded off to forced labor camps en masse. Soon anyone caught resisting collectivization was branded a kulak and taken away to make his contribution to Stalin's five-year plan. A few close friends and I got together and we began to organize a resistance group. But then, as we were trying to buy arms, somebody we asked told the police, and we were arrested. Some managed to run away, but I got five years hard labor and was taken to the construction site of the Volga White Sea Canal. I was put to work on deepening the bed of the canal, which was being dug out of the rock. There were two of us to a team. One would be holding a long crowbar and the second would be hitting it with a mallet weighing eight kilograms. The work norms were backbreaking. people died, mostly because we had to work without any rest. Seven days every week and ten hours every day. There were no free days, nothing, just work and work. 
that no matter what the weather was like, in wind, frost or snowstorm, people were driven to work on the canal. Completely exhausted, they would sink to the ground, fall over, and the snow would soon cover them. And they would be left there. Collectivization was made out to be a great victory for the party and Russia as a whole, but in fact it brought disaster. Though every tractor was treated as a triumph for socialist agriculture, only a fraction of the machinery promised by Stalin at the start of the campaign ever materialized. Meanwhile, millions of peasants destroyed their possessions rather than let the collective farms have them. of Russia's horses and cattle, and over two-thirds of all its sheep and goats were slaughtered. Vast tracts of land remained untilled, and after the requisitioning raids of the police, most of the villages were left without even the seed grains for the sowing season. So instead of raising yields, collectivization brought famine, such as Russia had not seen even at the time of the Civil War. Prisoners coming to the camp brought news of the growing famine in the Ukraine. They came in train loads and told us of people dying of starvation. My wife wrote that our neighbor had died and that my uncle had died. They had been young, healthy people. Why had they died? My wife couldn't say, but I knew, and my brother died also. Stalin's industrialization campaign was, like collectivization, a rational policy pushed to mad extremes. A year after the start of the five-year plan, he replaced its targets with figures which his own economists thought unattainable. Stalin dismissed the experts daring to doubt his plans, and a whole generation of enthusiasts threw themselves into his campaign, fired by the impossible challenge he set them. Vladimir Voronel, a young engineer at the time, was one of those enthusiasts. I was sent to the town of Makhachkala in Dagestan. That's in the northern Caucasus. They sent me to Derbend, one of the most ancient cities. As a matter of fact, I didn't even know it existed until I graduated. A huge cannery was to be built there. Because there were no experts available at the time, I was sent there and I was all enthusiasm. I felt it was my duty to go and work on a construction project. So I was very pleased to go to Dagestan. We faced enormous difficulties. There were not enough qualified people. Also because bread was being rationed, before we could take on any extra workers, we had to get extra ration cards so that they would have something to eat. And bread was short. So there was a strict limit on how many workers we could take on. In addition, there was a shortage of fuel, of electric power, even of water for the construction work. So there were enormous problems. But I must say that we worked with great enthusiasm. We were young people and worked far beyond the eight-hour day. And despite all the formidable obstacles, got the job done. Our century will continue in a moment on A&E. To cheer his people on, Stalin kept up a barrage of propaganda extolling the successes of his industrialization drive. Soon he was promising the country that the five-year plan would in many respects be completed in four years, or even three and a half. But he also introduced incentive schemes, such as Russia had not seen since the 1917 revolution. 
He set his workforce strict norms which they had to fulfill if they wanted to earn even a basic living wage. At the same time, he offered an array of bonuses and privileges to people who did more than the norm. And he started up a whole shock worker movement designed to show that the impossible was attainable. Its greatest hero was to be a Donbass miner, Alexei Stakhanov, who allegedly fulfilled his norm 14 times over. And Stalin went on raising the norms, presenting his industrialization drive as Russia's life and death struggle against what he called hostile capitalist encirclement. She had to modernize herself in a decade or go under. Comrades, the pace must not be slackened. On the contrary, we must quicken it as much as is within our powers. This is dictated by our obligations to the workers and peasants of the USSR. This is dictated by our obligations to the working class of the whole world. To slacken the pace would be to lag behind, and those who lag behind are beaten. We are 50 or 100 years behind the advanced countries. We must make good this lag in 10 years. Either we do it, or they crush us. As Stalin himself was to admit later, none of the targets of the five-year plan came near to being realized. If anything, the insane pace dictated by him led to insane waste of materials and effort and plain chaos. Shortages of food and goods, worse than they had been for years, were the result. Industrial accidents grew frequent and assumed disastrous proportions. He blamed it all on saboteurs inspired or financed from abroad. The show trials of so-called saboteurs, accompanied by mass meetings to demand death for the enemies of the people, became a regular feature of the five-year plan. Defendants were pressured, cajoled, blackmailed into admitting to preposterous charges of plotting to undermine the Soviet economy. High-level planning officials were said to have formed a secret organization called the Industrial Party with the aim of wrecking the five-year plan on orders from French politicians. They went to prison for up to 15 years. Another group of saboteurs, supposedly in the pay of the West, were put on trial and shot for deliberately producing food shortages. And fantastic as may have been the charges, they carried a degree of conviction for a good many people. As for the trials that were taking place, many of us, myself included, felt that there had to be some truth in the charges, like the trial of the so-called Industrial Party. We felt there could be no smoke without fire. Most of the engineers felt that if someone had been arrested and put on trial, it meant that definitely they must have done something. And instead of lowering the targets, Stalin continued piling on the pressure. As Russia's absolute ruler, able to make his people and his party jump to his will, he refused to grasp that reality itself lay beyond his sway. Pictured as the supreme planner, he put the ideas of the party's radicals into practice using all of his superb talent for manipulation and his single-mindedness of purpose, his enormous organizing abilities and genius for propaganda. But he seemed no more to understand the economics involved than to care about the suffering he inflicted on the country. In fact, he and his followers seem to revel in the idea of sacrifices as a source of inspiration for the people. 
films about deadly sabotage drew from that source. The path to Russia's brilliant future was strewn with dangers, they said. people had to make good through even more heroic effort the harm done by enemies trying to derail the train of Stalin's industrial revolution Russia was bound to have casualties, but to die in that battle was a hero's death. In November 1932, Stalin's wife, Nadezhda Aleluyeva, committed suicide. Twenty-two years younger than Stalin and mother of his two children, this devoted and affectionate woman could no longer stand what he was doing to the country. After a celebration to mark the anniversary of the 1917 revolution, where she burst out about Russia's sufferings and the growing terror, only to be rudely shut up by her husband, she went home and shot herself. Stalin gave her a state funeral, which he did not attend. In five cataclysmic years, Stalin had changed the face of Russia. He had pushed new railways across the landscape and planted factories where nothing had stood before. But vast areas of the country lay devastated. And while his followers could feel proud of what they had built, the peasant masses, who were the bulk of his people, were seething with hatred of Stalin, the visionary tyrant. In the party itself, signed memoranda were being passed around, calling on the leadership to depose him. But he had pushed the country down a road along which there was no turning back. From now on, his industrialization drive, his disregard of the sacrifices he was imposing on his people, and his deafening propaganda to present it all as the march to paradise were to remain basic features of his reign. And far from trying to soothe the hatred he had excited, in the next five years he was to provoke the country and his party more cruelly than ever before. And he was to triumph over them by applying terror such as Russia had never seen.
You wouldn't know it to look at him, a chunky man in a peasant's cap with a walrus mustache, a streetcar conductor maybe, but hardly the look of a dictator. But by the early 1930s, Stalin had nearly 200 million people dancing to his tune, and the dance was about to get even more frenzied. Join us next time for part three of Stalin, the Red Czar. For Our Century, I'm Edward Herman on the A&E Cable Network. They have it direct, they say. If you can get Bob, go ahead. He's going. He's going. And we're not getting it, so perhaps we'd better go back to the black box. We're, we're not getting it on a direct feed, Frank. We may have to return to that black box. Bob, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we are again experiencing difficulty with the uh, feed. So would you start at the top again, please, Bob? And I'll repeat you as I did the last time. Freeway. We were yeah, headed for the freeway. That's what I... That's what I... So we were. The last rites of the Roman Catholic Church Thank you. have been administered to President Kennedy, who is said to be seriously wounded in a Dallas hospital. After being shot at, during a motorcade through the city. Well, if you get that face... The rights were administered a few moments ago by Father Hubert. They do not necessarily mean that the president's condition is fatal. White House officials say the president's condition is still uncertain. He was carried into the hospital unconscious. From the car in which he and Governor John Connolly of Texas were both shot at. Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy, who is in the rear seat of the open car beside the president, was not hurt. Vice President Lyndon Johnson, who was with the president, walked into the hospital. Bob, let me interrupt. Was he in the same car? All right, please, go ahead. Walked into the hospital, holding his own arm, holding his own arm. Uh, just a moment, Bob. I'm going to interrupt for a bulletin that the Associated Press has moved from Dallas. Mrs. Lyndon Johnson said after a visit, yes, please go ahead then, Bob, who just emerged from the, from the area where the president has been taken, said that her husband, the vice president, is fine. She would not say anything about the condition of President Kennedy, however. She appeared to be in a state of shock. <coughs> and was hurried away by White House personnel. The hospital is reported to be preparing a blood transfusion for both the President and Governor Connolly. Bob is telling me that the latest he knows at the moment is that the is that the president's condition is serious and uncertain. That or how many times? We do not know exactly where he was struck, nor how many times. But he was carried into the hospital. But he was carried into the hospital. Unconscious and bleeding. Unconscious and bleeding. And last rites of the church have just been administered. And last rites of the church have just been administered. That's all for the moment, Frank. And Bob tells me that's all for the moment. Uh, Bob? Yeah. Uh, if you can there, the there is uh, there is this additional detail from the hospital. An assistant to Governor Connolly said he talked to the governor in the hospital operating room. He said the governor was shot just below the shoulder blade in the back. The assistant, okay. Bill Stinson, said he asked the governor how it happened, and he said, I don't know. I guess from the back they got the president, too. These are quotes from Governor John Connolly, who was also wounded. Uh, 
there are additional reports that uh, the governor's aide asked the governor if there was anything he could do, and all the governor said was just take care of Nellie for me. That is Governor Connolly's wife. Uh, she was uninjured. Uh, also, Mrs. Kennedy was not injured. The, uh, as Robert McNeil reported, the last rites of the Roman Catholic Church have been administered to the president, but this in no way indicates that it is expected that he will lose his life. And uh, Chet has something more. Uh, Director, D Director J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI has telephoned the Dallas FBI office ordering an all-out investigation of the attempt today in the lives of the President and Governor John Conley of Texas. Here is an item. Both women, meaning Mrs. Kennedy and Mrs. Conley, disappeared into the emergency section of Parkland Hospital to await news of their husbands. Outside the emergency room in a buff-walled buff hallway, anxious members of the White House staff gathered, including Major General Chester V. Clifton, military aide to the President, and Brigadier General Godfrey McHugh, the Air Force aide. Uh, Mrs. Evelyn Lincoln, uh, the President's Secretary, Pamela Tenure, Press Secretary to Mrs. Kennedy, and other members of the staff were so shown yes. to a special waiting room not far from the emergency room area where the President uh, was lying. As oh. uh, Frank McGee has reported on direct word from our correspondent, uh, in Dallas, uh, a crowd is gathering outside Parkland Hospital in Dallas. Okay. There's also this, Chet, uh, repeating what we got from Fort Worth, that sheriff's officers have taken a young man into custody and are questioning him, but there is no indication that uh, any charges have been placed against him. There is no indication that he is uh, directly involved in this attempt on the life of President Kennedy and Texas Governor John Conley. Uh, Bill, I... I think yes. we have a picture of the President and Mrs. Kennedy as they arrived in Dallas this morning, and I have some fragmentary copy on the first speech which the President delivered in Dallas. This is the uh, picture of the President and Mrs. Kennedy. I think the camera uh, that has they, you, Chet, is the one that would have to get the picture. Me, I'll hold it up over here. This is the picture of the first family, or the President and Mrs. Kennedy, rather, arriving in Dallas only a couple of hours before uh, the assassination attempt. The first speech that the president delivered in Dallas, speaking in an area where supporters are booming Senator Barry Goldwater's chances for the Republican nomination, the president said that ignorance and misinformation if allowed to prevail in foreign policy handicaps the country's security. This was a speech prepared for the Dallas Citizens Council, the Dallas Assembly, and the Graduate Research Center of the Southwest. He did not specifically mention Senator Goldwater by name. The president said, in a world of complex and continuing problems, in a world full of frustrations and irritations, America's leadership must be guided by the lights of learning and reason, or else those who confuse rhetoric with reality and the plausible with the possible will gain the ascendancy with their seemingly swift and simple solutions to every world problem. Chet, there's also this. Uh, in Washington, uh, the two president's brothers, his two brothers, Attorney General Robert Kennedy and his younger brother, Senator Edward Kennedy, are on their way to Andrews Air Force Base. They will fly to Dallas. Uh, additional details from the hospital. Uh, Vice President Lyndon Johnson has not been injured in this attack on President Kennedy and Texas Governor Connolly. Uh, the Vice President is somewhere in the same hospital where the President is being treated, Parkland Memorial in Dallas. Uh, it is reported he is badly shocked by the shooting, that doctors are trying to keep him as quiet as possible, and that he is under heavy Secret Service and police protection. It's also noted that throughout the trip in Texas, when uh, the President and the Vice President have been in the same motorcade, they have been kept in separate cars, um, a precaution against just such an attempt as was obviously made today. Chet? I referred a moment ago and read uh, an excerpt from the speech which President Kennedy delivered to a breakfast crowd this morning earlier. The breakfast crowd of 2,200 people rose in ovation after the speech, and a few minutes later, the president said he felt like he did in France two years ago when he identified himself as the man who accompanied Mrs. Kennedy to Paris. you have anything else, Frank? Yes, there was just a... Excuse me just a moment, John. Uh, there was just word from the hospital that they have dispatched a call for a neurosurgeon. Uh, 
I understand, would indicate that uh, one of the two had been hit in the head, would it not? Or either the head or possibly some spinal damage. Uh, there is also this, uh, understandably, in a situation like this, the information comes in fragments and comes from uh, unexpected places and uncontrolled angles. Senator Ralph Yarborough, Texas Democrat, who was uh, in a nearby car when the attack took place on the president, said he saw the president's lips moving at what he called a normal rate of speed while Mr. Kennedy was being rushed to the hospital. How much it means, we do not know. There is further word from the hospital, Bill, that uh, they're trying to make arrangements as quickly as they can for a press conference where as much uh, actual and detailed information as they have can be uh, disseminated. And there is word here, Frank, that at least one neurosurgeon has arrived at the hospital. I should imagine in a case such as this that uh, virtually every medical specialist of any sort and description and capability would be called into the hospital so that all uh, medical treatment would be available to the president. Chet? In just this momentary lull, I would assume that the memory of every person listening at this moment has flashed back to that day in April 1945 when Franklin Delano Roosevelt... Excuse me, Chad. Here is a flash from the Associated Press, Dateline Dallas. Two priests who were with President Kennedy say he is dead of bullet wounds. There is no further confirmation, but this is what we have on a flash basis from the Associated Press. Two priests in Dallas who were with President Kennedy say he is dead of bullet wounds. There is no further confirmation. This is the only word we have indicating that the President may, in fact, have lost his life. It has just moved on the Associated Press wires from Dallas. The two priests were called to the hospital to administer the last rites of the Roman Catholic Church, and it is from them we get the word that the President has died, that the bullet wounds inflicted on him as he rode in a motorcade through downtown Dallas have been fatal. We would remind you there is no official confirmation of this from any source as yet. Bill, just moments before you brought the flag, I had word from the hospital that the Vice President, Lyndon Johnson, and his wife had just left the hospital, then rushed away into a motorcade and departed. This, Frank, might, might be confirmation yes, of the flash. We must stand by for confirmation, as Bill has yes. uh, emphasized. This is rather sketchy information. We will stand by. We should have... Now, uh, there apparently is word that this AP flash, this report from the two priests, that the president has died of bullet wounds is confirmed. We will attempt now to get to station WBAP-TV in Fort Worth, Dallas for confirmation. We go to newsman Tom Murphy. Substantiating this, but not confirming it, is a report about five minutes ago by the Dallas Police Department to all of its officers that the president had died. Some three to five minutes later, the AP flashed that two priests at the hospital say the president is dead. Charles Murphy, returning now to NBC in New York. Word uh, from two sources. Again, it is not... All right. Excuse me, we have uh, NBC's Bob McNeil on the line now with a report. Please go ahead, Bob. White House Press Secretary. Malcolm Kilduff has just announced that President Kennedy died at approximately 1 o'clock Central Standard Time, which is about 35 minutes ago. After being shot at... After being shot... By an unknown assailant... By an unknown assailant... During a motorcade drive through downtown Dallas. During a motorcade drive through downtown Dallas. The president died. The president died. Approximately 25 minutes. Approximately 25 minutes. After the attack took place. After the attack took place. He had been rushed, bleeding and unconscious. He had been rushed, bleeding and unconscious. To the Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas. To the Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas. And was given blood transfusions. And was given blood transfusions. About 15 minutes ago... About 15 minutes ago, reports NBC's Bob McNeil from Dallas, to whom I'm talking now. A priest emerged... A priest emerged... After having given the president... After having given the president... The last rites. The last rites. Just before the announcement of the president's death was made... Just before the announcement of the president's death was made... Vice President Lyndon Johnson... Vice President Lyndon Johnson... Uh, emerged grim-faced. Emerged grim-faced. And was driven off with a police escort. And was driven away with a police escort. 
to assume to assume the constitutional responsibilities the constitutional responsibilities of the presidency of the presidency a casket a casket has just been brought into the emergency ward has just been brought into the emergency ward of this hospital of this hospital for president kennedy for president kennedy the attack took place the attack took place uh, as the president was just completing as the president was just completing what amounted to what amounted to a triumphal drive a triumphal drive through downtown Dallas through downtown Dallas encountering the biggest encountering the largest and in some ways the most friendly crowds and in some ways the most friendly crowds of his two-day Texas tour of his two-day Texas tour Dallas police Dallas police had put into effect had put into effect the most the most stringent security precautions in the city's history. The most stringent security precautions in the city's history. Because they had anticipated. Because they had anticipated. There might be some demonstrations. There might be some demonstrations. Against President Kennedy. Against President Kennedy. Like those which uh, marked the visit. Similar to those which marked the visit of UN Ambassador Adlai Stevenson. Of UN Ambassador Adlai Stevenson. On October 24th. On October 24th. Um, Mrs. Kennedy. Mrs. Kennedy. Who was sitting beside the president. Who was sitting beside the president. In the open car. In the open car. Was not hurt. Was not hurt. However, the governor of Texas. However, the governor of Texas. Uh, John Connolly. John Connolly. Who was also in the car. Who was also in the car. Was wounded reportedly in the chest. Was wounded reportedly in the chest. And a more blood. A big, a repeat, Bob. F further supplies of blood. Further supplies of blood. For transfusions for the governor. For transfusions for the governor. Have just been brought into the hospital. Have just been brought into the hospital. Um, the shooting came. The shooting came. According to witnesses. According to witnesses. From the second floor. From the second floor. Of a building called the Texas School Book Depository called the Texas School Book Depository. Which is about 100 yards. Which is about 100 yards. From the tree-lined parkway. From the tree-lined parkway. On which the president was driving when the shooting occurred. On which the president was driving when the shooting occurred. Uh, three shots were heard. Three shots were heard. Frank, that's about all I can tell you at the moment. Bob, thank you very much. We'll keep the line open. Okay, we'll keep the line open. That was a report from NBC's Robert McNeil at the hospital in Dallas, Texas, confirming <coughs> by uh, way of word from the White House press secretary that President Kennedy is dead. The death, uh, according to Malcolm Kilduff, who was acting as the president's secretary on this trip, came roughly 39 minutes ago at about 1 o'clock Dallas time. Uh, there is... Uh, Further word that Vice President Lyndon Johnson was taken from the hospital and he was not wounded. He has been taken from the hospital off to a secluded place. Uh, he will assume the constitutional duties succeeding now the late John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the former president, uh, the late president of the United States. Now, uh, it is necessary even at a time when an event is yes, so Bob. fresh upon us to look forward. We will yes. do that now as we go to NBC News, You're on Washington, TV, Bob. and David yes. Brinkley. I'm relaying. Right, I'm relaying your... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. The situation is, of course, that the Vice President, Lyndon Johnson, will be given the oath of office as President of the United States as soon as it can be done. Um, I haven't had time to check this, but I believe the oath can be administered by anyone who can, uh, a justice of the peace or anyone who can administer an oath. Had it happened in less unfortunate circumstances, uh, he normally would be sworn in by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. But in this case, he will be sworn in by, by anyone who has the power to do it. That means, therefore, that Lyndon Johnson will be President of the U.S. and will finish out the the uh, Mr. Kennedy's term running until January of 1964. What happens then, obviously, we don't know. The next in line for the presidency then, after Mr. Johnson becomes John McCormick of Massachusetts, Representative John McCormick of Massachusetts, who is the Speaker of, <clears throat> the, Speaker of the House. He is, uh, as I say, next in line. We were told a few minutes ago the Air Force had four jet airplanes on the ramp at nearby Andrews Air Force Base, ready to take off for Texas, and perhaps by this moment they have. I don't know. 
presumably to bring Mr. Johnson and other members of the party back here and or to take some of the members of Mr. Kennedy's family to Texas. Um, I assume, though we don't, we have no other details as yet, but I assume that uh, Mr. Johnson will return to Washington immediately and will take over the late President Kennedy's duties. Now that is about all of the detail we have at the moment. As I reported earlier, Senator Edward Kennedy, the President's brother, was presiding over the Senate in Lyndon Johnson's absence. The Vice President, when he leaves his job in the Senate, can turn the gavel over to anyone any member. In this case, Senator Edward Kennedy was presiding when the word came of the shooting. At that time, it was not known whether the president was dead or alive. A reporter in the press gallery upstairs overlooking the Senate gave the word to a Senate page who then went down and told senators on the floor, the leadership, and the Senate was adjourned immediately and then was called back into session for a prayer by the Senate chaplain, the Reverend Frederick Brown Harris. In the meantime, uh, the members left the floor and gathered around uh, the news tickers and waited to see what has happened, and by now, they know. Again, uh, the few sketchy details we have at the moment, the White House was, uh, w was not getting information very rapidly because of the confusion and the haste at the scene, so what we have learned, we have learned from Texas, not from here. Here is a late report. Cabinet members members of Mr. Kennedy's cabinet, that is Secretary of State Dean Rusk, the Secretary of Interior, uh, Stuart Udall, and uh, others, but I'm relying on memory. I don't remember who else was there. were on their way to Japan as a part of a mission to discuss trade with the Japanese and other matters. They were one hour out of Hawaii. They have turned back to the United States. We don't know yet if they're coming to Washington or Dallas, but I would assume Washington. There isn't much they could do in Dallas. Pierre Salinger is with them. Uh, the Kennedy children's, Bob Goralski, who is at the White House, NBC's reporter there, says the Kennedy children are still there, and it's a normal school day for them, for Caroline and her classmates. It, we are now told that the president was shot once in the head. Governor Connolly of Texas was hit both in the head and the wrist, we are told. The police have found a rifle of some foreign make. We don't, know, uh, we don't know what make, nor do we know exactly who had it, but we are told again, as we've reported earlier, that a young man was picked up at the scene and is being questioned. We don't know who he is. That is, uh, well, that's all we have at the moment. Vice President, Lind uh, Vice President Lyndon Johnson will now be sworn in as President of the United States and will serve out the remainder of Mr. Kennedy's term, which runs until January 20th, I believe, 1964. A little more, about a, little, about a year and a half from now. Beyond that, we don't know. Chet, Frank, Bill, you there? Any more from Texas or elsewhere? Yes, David, just this. President Kennedy was assassinated today in a burst of gunfire in downtown Dallas, Texas. Texas Governor John Conley was shot down with him. The president, cradled in his wife's arms, was rushed in the, his blood-spattered limousine to Parkland Hospital and taken to an emergency room. An urgent call went out for nurses and uh, for blood. The president was 44 years old. He was shot once in the head, as David has just reported. Governor Conley was hit in the head and the wrist. Police have found a foreign make rifle. The president was conscious as he arrived at the hospital. Father Huber from Holy Trinity Roman Catholic Church was called and administered the last rites of the church. Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson, who now becomes president of the United States, was in a car behind the Kennedys and the Connollys. He is to be sworn into office as soon as possible. He rushed to the hospital and then was whisked away again by Secret Service men. His whereabouts, certainly, and as we can understand, is being kept secret. Yes. Kennedy lived about an hour after a sniper cut him down as his limousine left downtown Dallas. Automatically, of course, the mantle of the presidency falls now to Lyndon B. Johnson, a native Texan who had been riding two cars behind the chief executive. Here's one other little bit of information. The priests came out of the ward at approximately 1.37 p.m. Central Standard Time. The announcement by the two priests brought audible sobs from a crowd of scores of newsmen and other citizens crowded around the emergency ward entrance of the hospital. Senator Ralph Yarborough of Texas, talking only a few minutes before to the newsmen, 
collapsed in sobs as he told of witnessing the slaying of the president. Yarbrough said he was in the third car behind the president. It seemed to him, he said, that at least two of the shots came from the right rear. He said he couldn't say anything about the third shot. So that is the story. The president of the United States is dead. The new president is President Lyndon Johnson. The memories of, I suppose, all of us are flashing back to that warm April spring day of 1945 when we lost the wartime president, Franklin D. Roosevelt. For many of us, this is the second time around that we have been through one of these crises. The last shooting incident, not uh, fatal, involving a president occurred in 1950 when President Harry S. Truman was in office and was living in Blair House in Washington. The High White House was being renovated at that time. You may recall that two Puerto Rican national democracy. Now, it was the first battleground of the Cold War, where America and her allies decided to take a determined stand against the onrush of communism through post-war Europe. And if we hadn't have supported these people, there's without a question of a doubt, Stalin would have taken them all out, and Europe would be communistic today. It was a battleground sad and savage enough for the most tragic of Greek tragedies. A civil war where Greek turned against Greek, village fought village, and father killed son. To the Greeks, it was much more complicated and contorted than a struggle against the spread of communism. It was a war that had its roots in their country's troubled 20th century. Greece had long been a pawn in the games that the superpowers played on the map of Europe. Since the 19th century, Great Britain believed Greece was critical for protecting the routes through the eastern Mediterranean and the area around the Persian Gulf. Tsarist Russia, meanwhile, eyed Greece as a possible answer to her long search for warm water ports. Ironically, the superpowers united to establish modern Greece as a monarchy. Despite the fervent loyalty of some subjects, many Greeks resented the monarchy that had been foisted on them from abroad. During the 1920s, the country divided into a bitter struggle between monarchists and republicans. In 1924, a republic was declared and the king was sent into exile. But it was not a happy time. The country was racked with poverty and overrun with refugees. The people wondered whether a return of the monarch would bring back prosperity. In 1935, they held a plebiscite. There was much intimidation and the voting was fixed. It was claimed that 97% of the population voted for King George II to return. George II returned to Greece, but before long, he had handed over dictatorial powers to General John Metaxas. It was a dangerous move. The monarchy became associated with Metaxas' ruthless brand of fascism. September 1939, war broke out in Europe. Greece was strategically too important to be left alone. In April 1941, the German army attacked. The Greeks and their British allies were routed. It was to be a bitter occupation. The Greek resistance waged a constant guerrilla war against the Germans, and the Germans retaliated. They destroyed a quarter of Greece's buildings. They devastated its agriculture and industry. They executed 70,000 people. King George fled to Cairo, a move that cost him much popular support and played into the hands of Greece's small but growing numbers of communists. The communists had organized the most effective resistance movement against the Germans, the ELAS, and had won much popular support. By 1944, the tide of World War II was beginning to turn. In June, the Allies landed at Normandy. The Soviets began their breakout too, advancing into Eastern Europe. While pleased with the Soviet advance against the Germans, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill was worried by its implications for the future. He was frustrated that President Roosevelt did not share his fears.
I'd been aware of, and of the growing tensions, the growing problems, uh, the differences of opinion between uh, the United States, Britain, and between the United States and Britain over how to deal with the Soviet Union, and then the very sharp differences of opinion over post-war Europe that uh, arose even before FDR died. And he thought it was quite incredible that they didn't realize that Stalin was just as much a dictator as the various other dictators we'd been fighting. So that rather put him against American policy at that time. But Churchill did win Roosevelt and Stalin's approval for a British invasion of Greece. On September 1944, they landed on the island of Kythera. They were met by members of the communist-dominated Greek resistance army, Elas, and were cheered through the streets. Within weeks, the Germans were defeated, but the battle for Greece was not yet over. A titanic struggle was about to erupt within Greece between the communists and monarchists. But beneath all this outward happiness lays the real tragedy of tortured Greece. A tragedy which has been fully exploited by the Germans. For the Greeks, though unanimously pro-British and anti-Nazi, are rent by bitter warfare between the opposing political factions. Their economy has collapsed. Disease and hunger stalk the land, though these pictures convey nothing of this. Yet on this day of liberation, their sorrows are forgotten. At the same time as Greece celebrated its liberation, the Soviet army swept across Romania and Bulgaria towards Greece's border. Stalin's men also advanced far into Poland and Hungary and Yugoslavia. They wanted to acquire these nations on their borders so as to form a buffer against a future attack from the West. They wanted to go in and try to gain further control of Europe. So that was the Soviet Union in possibly its most aggressive period. Churchill decided to go to Moscow to make a deal with Stalin. They divided Europe mathematically into areas of influence. The Soviet Union would control much of Eastern Europe, but Britain would oversee Greece. General Ronald Scobie was given command of Greece. Churchill ordered Scobie to keep the communists out and promote the monarchists. But by supporting an unpopular king, Churchill ironically encouraged support for the communists. On December 3, 1944, civil war erupted between the left and the right. The situation became so serious that Churchill traveled to Athens on Christmas Day. He had been to Athens himself over the dead body of the State Department and the President of the United States, both of whom strongly disapproved. Uh, in uh, Christmas of 1944 in order to make sure that the Elias rebels did not uh, conquer Greece. Churchill's mission to stop the war and prevent Greece from turning communist. The Eagle and the Bear will return in a moment. The Movado Museum Watch. The dial design chosen by the Museum of Modern Art for their permanent collection. The Black Sapphire Museum Watch. A futuristic interpretation of the classic. The Museum Watch. The Black Sapphire Museum Watch from Movado. We both have colds. Why is he bouncing around like it's a great morning anyway? Well, I'm so <coughs> tired and cranky and headachy, I can't even get started. Why? Because last night when he said, let's take NyQuil so we can have a good morning, I said, why? What's the nighttime sniffling, sneezing, coughing, achy, stuffy head fever so you can rest medicine got to do with morning, silly? He took it. I took these. <coughs> why? NyQuil. It's also the bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, fully rested, so take it at night and have a good morning medicine. So Dad had to leave all of a sudden for this big party in Paris. But I made sure he didn't miss anything back here. Facts in the article about your baseball game, you Dad? Sure am. Billy, great news on the game. I'm really proud of you. This is Tim Harris, and I'm standing at the Boston. I just saw you on TV. What do you think? I'm thinking we missed this in about four foot three. <laughs> AT&T Long Distance. No one else gives you this remarkable power to manage your world. No one. Thank you for using AT&T. I'm Edwin Newman. Join me for a salute to City Innovations, the third annual City Videos Competition, Sunday, December 10th, on A&E. What's that? 
Oh, that, that's a dolphin, dear. A curious cleaning woman. The animals here are here for experimentation. Makes a mysterious new friend. They're trying to get into dog. They share a special secret. <gasps> what a good boy. That she must no longer keep. You're too emotionally involved. They're gonna kill you. American Playwrights Theater presents Gene Stapleton, Rue McClanahan, and David Doyle in Let Me Hear You Whisper, Thursday, January 4th. We now return to the eagle and the bear. As 1944 came to a close, the sound of gunfire echoed through the mountains around Athens. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill had arrived to try to defuse the situation. But he did not receive an affectionate welcome. On the day following his arrival, three quarters of a ton of explosives was discovered underneath the hotel where the British supported Greek government was staying. Churchill's staff and cabinet believed that his insistence on restoring the monarchy had alienated many moderates, driving them into the communist camp. To many Greeks, monarchy equaled dictatorship. On December 31st, Churchill finally agreed on a compromise. He would appoint Archbishop Damaskinos as regent of Greece. Damaskinos was widely respected by all sides, and the issue of a monarchy would now be postponed until a referendum could be held. The British followed up their political maneuvers with a major military offensive. A month later, the rebels agreed to disarm in return for free elections and pardons. 700 miles away, in the mountains of the Crimea, the wartime allies were meeting at Yalta. It was here that Stalin assured Churchill that he had no intention of interfering in Greece. At that time, uh, around uh, 1945, April, the city was full of people from the farms. They'd been scared to stay in the farms, uh, not to get killed from various uh, groups. So I can't get even in my house. It was full of uh, these people. It was in this atmosphere of political confusion and economic chaos that the monarchists took control. They campaigned to bring back the king and began a reign of repression. Anyone opposed to the monarchy was liable to be imprisoned or exiled or murdered. By July 1945, more than 20,000 Greeks had been arrested. The British and the Americans became increasingly concerned about the extremism of the right, but feared communism even more. In September 1946, the referendum Churchill had promised was held to decide on the future of the monarchy. Once again, the voting was tampered with. Yesterday a republic, today for the third time a monarchy. Five years of exile ended, King George of the Hellenes attends his embassy. Once before, his royal approval sheltered the military dictatorship of General Metaxas. Today, destiny gives him a second chance. To survive in modern Europe, the royal prerogative must link with the people's belief in democracy. The future will show what lessons exile has taught King George of Greece. The repression did not stop. But then, the uh, anti-communist element in Greece uh, started massa to massacre uh, uh, Greece leftists and Greece communists. And this provoked slowly uprising uh, in Greece. The uprising was led by Nikos Zakharaevis, a communist who had spent four years during the war in Dachau concentration camp. The Greek army was unable to quell the rebellion, despite help from British troops. Britain had been economically ravaged by World War II and did not have enough resources to protect Western interests in the Mediterranean. And I happened to be in the president's office. It was in the latter part of December 1946 when <clears throat> we first received a hint from the British that they were going to have to forego their military and economic support of Greece and Turkey. And the president knew that it was going to be a very difficult but decisive decision. President Truman decided that Greece and the oil-rich Mediterranean region were too important to be allowed to fall to communism. 
the very existence of the Greek state is today threatened by the terrorist activities of several thousand armed men led by communists. I believe... Greece and Turkey were really the south anchor of a natural defense line that would extend up through Western Europe. He had many conferences with our leaders on the Hill. He finally concluded that it was absolutely necessary that we come to the defense of those two countries. If we did not, nobody else could do it. Europe was prostrate. They couldn't help. He understood why England had to withdraw from its support. And he stepped up to the problem and met it, which was one of the great advantages that he had, his courage and his decisiveness. Should we fail to aid Greece and Turkey in this fateful hour, the effect will be far-reaching to the West as well as to the East. We must take immediate and resolute action. I therefore ask the Congress to provide authority for assistance to Greece and Turkey in the amount of $400 million for the period... He went up to the Congress and spoke to a joint session and, and enunciated what became known as the Truman Doctrine. And in simple substance it said, it must be the policy of the United States to come to the aid of those countries who are being beset by communism either from within or from without. The free peoples of the world look to us for support in maintaining their freedom. If we falter in our leadership, we may endanger the peace of the world, and we shall surely endanger the welfare of this nation. That message rang around the world, and he stepped up and gave hope in the world. But even as the president announced his Truman Doctrine, the situation in Greece was becoming increasingly unstable. The eagle and the bear will return in a moment. Coming up on a and &E, travel on the heels of a spectacular winter climb up the most treacherous peaks of the Alps on Living Dangerously. Freedom to say and think what we believe, to express our individuality and diversity. That's our birthright, and it's ensured by this document. Join us and the National Archives in celebrating the 200th anniversary of the Bill of Rights. The Shower Massage by Teledyne Water Pit. The first true test of marriage can be suffering through a cold together. <laughs> you took your cold medicine and he took his. Uh, here, keep the box. You're not sneezing. How come you're not sneezing? You make discoveries. <coughs> you're not coughing. How come? And you see things you never saw before. What have you got over there, anyway? NyQuil. The nighttime sniffling, sneezing, coughing, aching, stuffy head fever so you can rest medicine. So Dad had to leave all of a sudden for this big party in Paris. But I made sure he didn't miss anything back here. Facts in the article about the baseball game to your dad? Sure am. Billy, great news on the game. I'm really proud of you. This is Tim Harris, and I'm standing at the Boston. I just saw you on TV. What did you think? I think you mean the sister in about four foot three. <laughs> AT&T Long Distance. No one else gives you this remarkable power to manage your world. No one. Thank you for using AT&T. We now return to the eagle and the bear. President Truman's announcement of his policy of containment that he intended to hold the line against communism received wide support in Congress and abroad. I think he believed, as, uh, as our leaders in government and the executive branch and the legislature did believe, we were doing our best to preserve uh, freedom. 
Churchill, of course, was delighted by the Truman Doctrine because it in fact proved what he'd all along believed, which was that we must save the Eastern Mediterranean from being communized. By April 1947, the first shipments of American supplies were unloaded in Greece. And that May, the Greek-Turkish aid bill was passed by overwhelming majorities in Congress. The bill gave Greece $350 million in aid and established a team of American military advisors. At that uh, point, I was very impressed to see in a matter of a couple of days, everything changed in uh, my unit. I can uh, describe you what we felt. Uh, America, we felt, was on our side. The German doctrine had, or has impact that it, uh, uh, it convinced the Greek people that his uh, fight was possible and that it should uh, take place. But despite the new help from the Americans, the war was going badly for the Greek army. The guerrillas' military campaign was now under the daring leadership of Marcos Vafiaves. Marcos, a man of uh, great strategic capabilities, but who was a tobacco worker, but during the occupation had given his proof that he was a mind who could organize, who could conceive battles. The guerrillas were based along the borders of Albania, Bulgaria, and Yugoslavia. And it was these communist countries, especially Yugoslavia, that gave them aid. Secretary of United Nations, Trig Veli, was in Yugoslavia. He asked me privately, why you help <laughs> Greek partisans? That was, he was here after the conflict with Soviet Union, and we may now spoke more openly. <laughs> I said, revolutionary idealism. And of course, we like it to have all Balkans, uh, leftist, communist, uh, to be also uh, stronger together with the Greece against uh, Western imperialism. <laughs> and this, this, those are the motives, really. The war was now being touted as a symbolic struggle between Western democracy and communism. Many felt that if communism could not be stopped in Greece, the rest of Europe might fall. Of course, we had to recognize that the Soviets were on an expansionist binge, if you will. They were going to extend their sphere of influence as far as they possibly could, and at any point where they sensed a weakness on the part of the United States and Western Europe, they would, they would press forward. And it would not only be in Western Europe, it would be in the Middle East. But despite the widespread perception, the Soviet Union did not have territorial ambitions in Greece. Stalin's ambitions were focused on Eastern Europe. He believed that Yugoslavia's meddling in Greece was needlessly arousing Western hostilities. When we were in Moscow, Stalin energically was against uh, any help to uprising in, in Greece. He saw realistically that his possibilities are first in Eastern Europe. America continued to blame the Greek Civil War on the Soviets, and American money flowed into Greece. The aid began to make a real difference when the U.S. military advisors were permitted to take a more active role in directing the fighting. General James Van Fleet, an outstanding and aggressive World War II commander, was placed in command of the American advisors. We had a date with General Van Fleet, and uh, we flew into Athens and talked with him, and uh, there was no question about the fact that our aid was preventing a communist takeover of, uh, of Greece. Finally, the Greek army began taking the fight to the guerrillas, harassing them in their mountain retreats and chasing them back over the borders. The guerrillas, too, were no longer receiving so much support from President Tito's Yugoslavia. Tito had decided that he could not afford to be distracted by the war. He told the American ambassador, yes, I know that you Americans are worried about communism thrusting out into other areas. But do not forget 
Yugoslavia's chief national task is internal development, and we need peace. In May 1949, at the United Nations, Soviet representatives led by Andrei Gromyko, the deputy foreign minister, approached United States officials and offered to help bring an end to the war. But the talks collapsed, and in August, the Greek army launched a massive assault on guerrilla strongholds. It broke the back of the communist army, and that October, they conceded defeat. The battle to keep communism out of Greece had been won. To the United States, it mattered little whether the Soviet Union had been responsible for the civil war. What did matter was that the West had said no more to the spread of communism in Europe. It was a victory for the eagle over the bear. Monday, Russia overpowers the 1956 Hungarian uprising on Our Century, Budapest, Communism with Tanks. Wednesday, Austria and Czechoslovakia fall victim to Nazi invasion on Why We Fight. Now stay tuned for Living Dangerously, next on A&E.